Welcome to the Israel Bible Podcast. My name is Cindy Parker. I am an author, a speaker, and the professor of Holy Land Studies at the Israel Bible Center. I'm passionate about reading the Bible in the physical, historical, and cultural context of its day. In this podcast, I'd like to invite you to join me as I sit down each week with other faculty members of IBC to discover new aspects of the Bible. Ah, these are some of my all-time favorite dialogues because as a modern audience reading an ancient text, we know that the Bible does not need to be rewritten, but it needs to be reread. In today's episode, we are continuing with a roundtable talk conversation between Dr. Yeshaya Gruber and Dr. Hindi Naiman. This particular roundtable talk is called Revelation and Interpretation. Last week, we heard her finesse the definitions of terms like apocalypse, second temple, and the authority of scripture. And this week's conversation continues along this track. Dr. Nyman is the Oriel and Lang Professor of Interpretation and Holy Scripture and the Director of the Center for the Study of the Bible at the University of Oxford. She has published extensively in biblical and other related fields ranging from philology to cultural and legal studies. This week, we will start with a question Dr. Gruber posed to Dr. Nyman during their conversation. It's a really good context question, and it leads into great timeline questions that do more to blend these blocks of times that we typically use as shorthand. And a little bit like last week's conversation, it's going to question the categories we often use when looking at history and scripture. Lean in and enjoy the conversation. You mentioned, for example, Philo of Alexandria, writing the first half of the first century, very influenced by um, Greek and Roman culture and ideas. And many of these texts that you're describing show various um, degrees of influence, perhaps um, from Hellenistic, you know, the Hellenistic period generally. Uh, And I think there's no question, as you were saying, that they continue to influence us today, you know, through the long histories of Judaism and Christianity. Many of these ideas have entered into kind of the mainstream of Judaism and Christianity, even from texts that never made it into any canon. Um, And some of them did make it into some canons, not into other canons. But I'm wondering, uh, so Philo writing in Egypt, um, I think the book of Revelation that you mentioned before is also from outside the land of Israel. And there are others, you know, some inside, some outside. Is this a meaningful distinction in this period to... um, kind of draw at least a little bit of a line and say these texts are related, they're dealing with similar issues, but it does make some sort of difference if they're from within the land of Israel or outside, or does it not really matter in this period? So It's a very good question. And you must know, I know you know that this is hotly debated these days. Even Philo's writings, there are many arguments that some of his work um, was written in Rome, some was written in Alexandria. Did he go to Israel? Had he spent time there? Is this eyewitness account? I mean, this, these are ongoing debates. So there are two different ways of um, parsing your question. One way is to ask whether or not it makes a difference if a text is written in Greek or Hebrew. It's about language difference. And the other is about a location difference. I'm going to answer both parts of the question with one answer. And I'm going to say that I think we really need to rethink how plurilingual or multilingual ancient Judaism is from its earliest inception. And that many of the material objects, for example, coins, clothing, glassware, um, scribal practices that are found, for example, in the Qumran caves show integration into the ancient world. Um, And it's very important to recognize that many of the concepts and innovations that are distinctive about the Dead Sea Scrolls are also participating in Hellenistic thought, Hellenistic Jewish thought. Philo also has certain features, which many people have worked on, that um, are shared, shared interpretive features that you will find first in Breshit Rabbah or in other rabbinic, Tanaitic and Amoraic collections. How is this possible? How does this make sense? 
When I teach texts like Philo of Alexandria alongside a text like Instruction or the Hodayo, the Thanksgiving hymns, or the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice alongside a text like Wisdom of Solomon, I do so not ignoring the fact of location and the fact of linguistic registers, right? That these are important differences. However, I think what's been overlooked um, is, um, sh is the shared context. And it's happened because people have not paid sufficient attention to this later period as a period of vibrancy and vitality. And part of it is because the whole discourse about the parting of the ways has wanted so much to emphasize Christianity and the Greco-Roman world on the one hand, and Judaism somehow belongs to a, a preserved past, something remote, something far away, um, something that is not integrated in Western civilization. And I would say that couldn't be farther from the truth. And people have been working on philosophical projects, historiographical projects, um, linguistic projects, and I can name many of them for you today, that really challenges this notion of separateness. I think that um, that some of the some of the work that's been done that wants to emphasize land of Israel versus diaspora is politically motivated, and um, or or you know when you ask questions, why is a text written in Greek or in Hebrew or in Aramaic? The communities are multilingual, and we and they continue to be in different ways at different times. So much so that I've argued that you can talk about natural thinking and higher and lower correspondences, um, um, as well as um, paradigm, tavnit, paradigma and archetype already in the Persian and Hellenistic periods. I mean, one piece that's missing from this larger mix is um, the Babylonian tradition. So people just take for granted that um, Babylonian Persian traditions are inextricably mixed up with biblical materials um, without any apology or discomfort, but the Hellenistic materials also belong in this mix, as do Egyptian materials. So there is new work that's happening now that helps to integrate these larger cross-cultural conversations. You uh, were talking about, um, in various ways, continuity, you know, from biblical times all the way through these um, sorts of texts and into rabbinic Judaism and even into Christianity, you know, the the both rabbinic Judaism and Christianity drawing inspiration from um, what I would normally call second temple period texts, or, you know, this type of literature of Hellenistic Judaism. I wonder, do you see a, um, a break as well as continuity when we, when we talk about, let's say the second century, third century, fourth century, as compared to earlier times with the formation of, you know, some sort of official, if you will, rabbinic Judaism or Christianity in the Roman empire, and what I mean by that is uh, it could also be a stereotype, but many people view, you know, second, third, fourth century as a kind of um, solidification out of uh, the variety that existed, you know, in, in earlier centuries, all the different groups of the first century, you know, the Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, um, followers of Jesus and so forth, Hellenistic Jews. And then you get kind of orthodoxies. At least that's a kind of stereotypical picture that, you know, the rabbis are going to form their orthodoxy, the Christians are going to form their orthodoxy. Um, do you see a kind of break there or do you still so see no, more continuity? No. So, so first of all, I need to say that my expertise is, a, is of the earlier period. However, what I was already alluding to earlier, and here I quote and invoke um, scholarship from a later period like Jeffrey Kahn or Ronnie Volant or Dorota Molin or... Um, Shaul Shakaid and um, there, there are others who worked on much later work and have considered the intermingling of cultural traditions. Entanglement is the word that's used um, and convergence. This is the same language that I want to use now and bring it into the Hellenistic period, but it really never stops. I'll give you examples of the amulets and the magic bowls, which are non-normative for, uh, for you know, someone who's thinking about rabbinic Judaism or the Hechalot materials. And they're very much a part of Judaism in the late antique and even later periods. You know, I, I, don't, um, I, I don't think that, you know, that we should think about these as separate sects. I think that we should understand that Judaism was, is, and will always be a very complicated set of different communities 
with different orientations um, and some and, and many shared beliefs, but there is not a uniform version. And this is something that rabbinicists have been arguing now for a long time, that it's not only the rabbis that define um, Judaism in late antiquity and beyond. It's a much more complicated and diversified picture, which doesn't mean that there aren't interpretive communities that create um, bodies of texts. We don't want to be co-opted by or straitjacketed by retrospective narratives of history when we know that it's so much more complicated and two findings that have radically transformed the way we have to learn how to retell our own history are the Cairo Geniza and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And as Jews, we can be open to the retelling of history um, as we think and rethink what the possibilities were for Jews within a variety of diasporas, even Israel as a diaspora in the absence of, um, of you know, of community of government and um, um, of political independence and the way in which these communities grew in and out of many, many different cultures. So I, I take this as a sign of vitality and um, tenacity um, and, um, and willingness to move with the world around them. Vitality and tenacity. I love it. This is the perfect time to hear more about what Dr. Nyman is working on now. If you've enjoyed this conversation and you find some of her ideas to be thought-provoking, like all of them, well, how do you dig in more? In fact, she has a new book coming out that is called Reading Practices and the Vitality of Scripture. It will be published through Oxford University Press. I, for one, am super excited for this book to come out. But what topics does this book cover? One of the things I'm doing is finishing a project on this on this larger um, uh, research on vitality of Judaism, which I can describe, but it's also already been published along the way to talk about, you know, vitality and vibrancy isn't only normative or canonical. It lives in the margins um, and it lives outside of the center. It also lives in the center. So we have to be prepared to allow ourselves to redraw the circles of who belongs and how to understand our past and our present. Um, and how to give voice to people that are called sectarian or marginal as part of our new, a, new, a new center. And then to rethink the way in which we tell our histories. In my own book now, um, it's in three parts. The first talks about what vitality means and how to think and rethink questions of authorship and canon. So um, really reflecting on the work I've done and what more there is to say about growth in dynamic texts. Um, the second part talks about memorialization and law and the way in which the rewriting of text itself um, brings, re-articulates or represents the text again in a number of different ways. So it's c combining memory with Torah as a way of arguing for vitality. And the third part considers um, natural thinking and human essence as two expressions of vitality in the second temple period or the Hellenistic period. And we see Hebrew texts, which draw from and contribute to Greek Jewish texts, where we think about what it is to be human in the face of disaster, in the face of being threatened, but also just in the face of our own mortality and right. how this is overcome through blessing and um, articulation of recognizing God as, as creator. This is what the texts do. Um, yeah. Well, Sorry. that sounds like a uh, breath of fresh air, you know, especially for people who feel like an overly stereotypical, ossified, traditional version of religion is disenfran disenfranchising to, you know, other other points of view. We've covered a great deal of ground and, you know, really only scratched the surface. But even your mention of the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, that has totally changed understandings of what was going on in, you know, 2000 years ago in Judaisms, for example. And there have been so many changes in the last 50, 100 years in um, studying early Judaism, early Christianity, Second Temple period, and so forth. I wonder, I know it's a big question or a two-part question, but number one, what do you see as the biggest differences that have, that have taken place? What are the most revolutionary changes that you've seen, maybe over your career, I guess, uh, in, in the areas that you study? And um, where do you think the fields are headed. Is there some sort of um, 
renewal that you uh, see taking place moving forward into the future? I'm going to talk about two major things that have happened, which must transform the way we do biblical studies. So one I've mentioned already, which is the findings both of the Tyrogeniza manuscripts, especially biblical manuscripts, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, understanding, and, and in that answer is about interpretation and practices of reading, which are so variegated and so dynamic across communities, even, even within single communities. You can have variegated practices. So it really complicates the way we think about communities in antiquity and also authorizes new ways of being. So there isn't a single right way. And it's very humbling for us, those of us that are trained as historians and philologists to think and rethink the way we teach language, the way we understand Hebrew grammar, the way we understand history, and the way we understand the history of early biblical interpretation, which is the life and breath of Judaism. Um, the second part, and this is a much more difficult answer, which um, I will I will give you, which is in a post-Shoah environment and in the birth of the academy, understanding the history of biblical studies is also understanding the history of anti-Semitism and understanding how some of the views in our field that are dogma, are like beliefs or, you know, historically sound views are very complicated. I've already alluded to a few um, um, are very complicated and informed by biases and racism, not only anti-Jewish, but especially anti-Jewish. And this is something that many of us are working on and thinking about. I did a big conference in Oxford. Lauren Stuckenbrook and Friedhelm Hartenstein are launching a three-part across 18 months conferences and workshops on this topic. The European Association for Biblical Studies, the head of the program, Thomas Wagner, invited a full day-long program reflecting on figures in the history of the field from 200 years ago to the present day in, and worrying about the methods and the figures that we study and how we study them. So this is a huge change. It's self-critical. It's very, very difficult. And this is not just about Christians studying Jews or people who you know, are um, ambivalent about you know, um, Zionism. This is not what this is about. This is actually about people in all religious backgrounds, asking them to think and rethink the way in which we've inherited methods in the field and whether or not these norms or these facts or these ways of doing history and analyzing texts need to be rethought. It's about periodization, but it's also about how we analyze texts and how we privilege texts, legal texts, prophetic texts, apocalyptic texts. What a stimulating and thought-provoking conversation. And that's not even all of it. You have an opportunity to dig into the details of the conversation by clicking on the link in the episode notes that go directly to the roundtable talk called Revelation and Interpretation. It's a conversation worth listening to maybe even a couple times. If you love conversations like this, join us at IBC, where you have access to many amazing courses that dig into the details of culture and interpretation, and a huge list of roundtable talks with world-renowned scholars. You can even earn credit towards Israel Bible Center Certificate Program in Jewish Context and Culture. Thank you to Jeremy McDonald from Mason Jar Music for doing an amazing job editing, mixing, and adding in all the good music. And thank you for hanging out with me and being curious about all things Bible-related. <laughs>